Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, and welcome to the Rose Bowl of Leeds Beckett University. We've been practicing that for a few months now as it's changed over from Leeds Met. Um, and a magnificent example of the facilities that exist across Leeds and West Yorkshire at the universities and colleges that I'm very, very happy to uh, represent in terms of partnership. We are the heart partnership. Um, I've been advised that we are not expecting fire drills this evening. So if the alarm does go off, you need to get out of here as quickly as you can without panicking. Follow Leeds Beckett, members of staff and ambassadors. They'll guide you out to safety outside. For those of you who haven't found the toilets yet, the gentlemen are just outside here through the door on the right-hand side. The ladies are across the bridge and on the right-hand side. Thank you for travelling from near and far for this, the 2014 National Care Leavers Week National Lecture. HART, as I mentioned, is a partnership of 12 West Yorkshire universities and colleges offering higher education who work collaboratively on a number of activities, not least developing support and activities for care experience young people. We are naturally delighted to host the National Lecture for the first time taking place outside London and Cambridge, so the first time up north. You should all have a programme, speaker biographies, and a pledge postcard on your chairs. Uh, we'll remind you about the pledge postcard after the Q&A panel at the end, but just so that you can bear this in mind as we go through the evening with the speakers. What we would like you to do with that pledge postcard is put your name and address on the right-hand side, as you would with a normal postcard, and on the left-hand side, put in your personal pledge as to how you might actually improve and support the transition of care leavers through the education system. We'll then send it out as a reminder to you, probably in the new year. And in the meantime, we'll have a look at the pledges and nick some of your good ideas, if you don't mind. I know there are many colleagues present who are members of the National Network for the Education of Care Leavers, a self-formed network of professionals working to support progression and transition in education, and therefore naturally keen, as you all are, to hear from Belinda Bluff, the National <laughs> Lecture Provider, and from Lem Cisse, uh, who has sponsored and provided the scholarship for Belinda to complete her PhD at the University of Huddersfield. Obviously, Lem is an internationally acclaimed poet, author, broadcaster, and playwright with a fantastic catalogue of work, amongst which my personal favourite, I have to say, is his adaptation of Benjamin Zephaniah's novel, Refugee Boy. And I'm going to be really cheeky before the end of the evening. I'm going to get Lem, hopefully, to sign my ticket from Refugee Boy bit of a groupie, sorry. Okay, I've got the money with me, Len. <laughs> there will be opportunities, obviously, to ask questions of Belinda and Lem at the end, and that session will be chaired by our chair of the, the Heart Partnership, Professor Margaret House, who is Vice-Chancellor of Leeds Trinity University. And we will be joined on the panel um, with Salim Tariq who is Chief Officer of Children's Social Work at Leeds City Council and who is going to start proceedings this evening with a short introduction on the Child Friendly Leeds Initiative. So, Sal, thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks, Ian. Uh, you'll have to forgive me whilst I uh, play with the uh, IT. Um, we've got uh, here today, and I'm not going to uh, <coughs> point them out, but... Um, We've got members here today of the um, uh, Have a Voice Council who are uh, uh, children in care or children who have um, uh, experienced care and um, they, uh, how can I get out of here? They, uh, they've just been uh, taking the piss out of me because uh, <laughs> uh, on the back of, of, of this you'll see me in a ridiculous suit <laughs> according to them so they've just been weighing up. Uh, who's going to wear it to which fancy dress party? Because I've said I'm never wearing it again. Uh, can I say welcome to Leeds? Um, I did my um, uh, social work qualification uh, here at uh, Leeds Metropolitan University, so it's uh, great for me uh, to be here and um, a real privilege for me be to be able to be speaking to you this evening. Um, I'm starting with this, which is a picture of uh, me and my mum. 
um, when I was little, so he's or. Oh. <laughs> and um, I, I've used that because um, a Japanese uh, friend of mine once said that if you do presentations, either show pictures of your children or show pictures of yourself as a child, and the audience will like you. So you are, <laughs> you are now duty bound to, uh, to Lionel. So I manage uh, the Children's Social Work Service here in Leeds, a um, whole host of uh, social work teams, children's homes, fostering services, uh, and uh, adoption services. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, Leeds as a, a child-friendly city. We're, we've got lofty ambitions in, in Leeds. Um, we've set out our strategy as a, a city council um, with our partners and businesses in Leeds to become the best city in the country by 2030. And as part of that, uh, our director, Nigel Richardson, always says, if you want to be the best city uh, in the country, first you have to be the best city for children. And so we've really uh, galvanised our strategy around uh, trying to become a, a child-friendly friend, city. It's not. Um, it's easy to kind of think that um, these things are uh, fluffy mission statements that senior managers uh, come up with and uh, never really mean anything. But actually, in child-friendly city, I think uh, we've got something really special going on in Leeds because I've seen um, how things have really improved uh, just on the back of having um, something that we can all get behind as a uh, as a whole partnership uh, in the city. Uh, but it's also based on UNICEF and UNICEF's version of what a child-friendly city represents. So as we go along this journey to become a child-friendly city, we will be measuring ourselves against um, things that UNICEF have said make up uh, child-friendly cities. It's always a, a kind of a work in progress. So I do get a lot of people saying, and we, we hear a lot of people saying, well, such and such a thing isn't um, very child-friendly, is it? And, and that's absolutely appropriate because part of setting out a mission to become child-friendly is about being able to be challenged about how we uh, operate on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's about a journey that we're on. We're not a child-friendly city right now, but that's our ambition. It's our ambition to become child-friendly, and therefore, as we go along that journey, then um, we'll, uh, we will uh, face challenges. Uh, the the uh, care lever and um, children in care councils that I told you about today, um, I, I was with them at um, Corporate Carers, which is our uh, political oversight um, that looks at uh, services for uh, looked after children in Leeds. And I have to say, they were absolutely brilliant. Very, very challenging, both of uh, the politicians that were there, um, but also of senior officers like myself. So they really do um, provide a very significant challenge uh, in terms of the work that, that, that we do, and really significant challenge in terms of how we develop our policies and procedures. And, and the whole idea, uh, behind Child Friendly is to try and answer these uh, simple questions. What's it like to be a child or young person growing up in Leeds and how do we make it better? You may well have heard of um, obsessions. Um, we have three obsessions um, in, uh, in Leeds which we hope that people can get uh, really get behind. Um, the first obsession is about uh, reducing of the need for children to become looked after. It's really important when you hear about that obsession because we're talking about reducing need. We're not talking about reducing numbers. If you reduce the need for children to become looked after, over time the numbers will follow. But it's our intention to try and work in a much more proactive and preventative way in order that children don't need to come into the care system. Those that do then come into the care system, we hope to give the best service possible. We want to make the best care system possible for those children and young people that really do need to be uh, in the care system. The second obsession is around school attendance. Now, the reason we've chosen these obsessions are because whilst they're important in and of themselves, they're also very important in terms of a whole series of other indicators, of a whole series of other measures um, that will really start to improve. So if you can uh, improve school attendance, Children will be seen every day by uh, teaching staff. We know that their educational outcomes will be better. We know their life chances will be better. But we also know that their health will be better. And we know on a day-to-day -day basis that they are safe and well. Our third obsession is destinations. So you'll hear a horrible term um, called NEATS. I don't like it, but it's about uh, young people and where they end up once they've been through school. Do they end up with uh, an opportunity of employment, education, or training? Um, and again, if we can start to improve destinations, then we will have to change a whole series of other things that make life better uh, for children and young people. <clears throat> uh, 
this great city, um, when you look around, the, um, <coughs> given where we are in um, uh, times of austerity, there's still a mass of building work that's going on. There's still a massive physical regeneration taking place across the city. So uh, soon we'll have John Lewis, um, which is being built at the, uh, at the moment. We've had the Trinity Centre built recently. Um, anybody been to the arena yet? Yeah, I, yeah we went, didn't we? Uh, I've been, I went to see Prince. Um, 20 years after I saw him in Sheffield, which he was absolutely brilliant. So the arena, again, um, just more and more physical regeneration. So the money's coming in to the city around um, physical, what the, what the uh, city looks like as a, uh, physically. If we don't match that with social regeneration, then it's just going to be a pretty place that looks okay. It's not going to regenerate itself. And so the whole idea behind uh, Child Friendly City is that we disproportionately invest in children. Because we know that if in this generation we disproportionately invest in children, then they will grow up in this city with loyalty towards the city. They will want to do well in this city. And all of that physical regeneration will be matched by bright young things with uh, ambition and with a future uh, within the city that they will stick with. And I, and I think that that, um, that is the essence of um, where we're trying to get to with that matching the physical and uh, social regeneration. Um, I'm not going to say too much more. Um, I've been speaking to Belinda. She's going to be uh, absolutely brilliant. Uh, I know uh, Lem a little bit now. I've met him a few times, and he's going to be uh, he's going to be great. I know you don't want to hear uh, from a boring suit like me um, for too long, um, but I do want to just uh, finish with a little video from children and young people in need telling you uh, a little bit about child friendly needs. I wake up every morning wishing for a sunny day and I open my curtains hoping there's someone out to play. I wash my face and brush my teeth and I start my five a day. I look beyond my seat is the right and I wish to go everywhere. The wheels on the bus go round and round and gets me safely there. My friends could come and we could go and hope we'll meet some new friends there. I like my school because it's cool. I get to learn and play. And after school, I like to go to the park and hope it's cleaner there. The bus drivers would care for me more. I would like to ride my bike everywhere and walk through the streets in my town without getting worried about all the cars around. I dream there is a giant trampoline and a hammock in the sky so I could rock my dreams into life and make a leap that keeps a child in mind. I want to be a ballerina and dance at the arena, become a footballer, bring us to the top of the league, play rugby, make music, be all I can be. This is my home, my future depends on it. In my dreams it might sound off the wall, but I am a child and I have big ideas, wishes and dreams for my future and all. I want a city that will fulfill my hope. Leaves is beautiful and leaves is kind. Look the other way, there are vulnerable kids, unhealthy lifestyles, businesses big and small. Help us please, involve yourselves, create more opportunities. A child-friendly lease should mean no more inequality. I love my city, I love my home, I love how the tall buildings protect me from the cold. I love how the lights light up at night and change colours like the arena walls. I wish and hope that my future will hold us, as time will change and I will grow. The bigger I grow, I'm filled with hope that I will work to build a home. Together we'll grow, alone we'll fall, the present needs you. The future depends on us, so let's come together and play. I love the uh, arena as a giant birthday cake. It's a <laughs> fabulous uh, image. Okay, that's it from me, so thank you very much. I'm going to uh, get Belinda up here to do her bit. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and it's an honour to be asked to give this lecture today to you all, especially during this week, which reminds us all of how crucial and important it is that we get the right kind of support for care leavers. 
This week doesn't just hold an academic relevance to me, it also holds a personal relevance, as I'm also a care leaver who's been through transition myself to independence and through, the, and through education. And today I'm going to focus along the theme of new belongings, but specifically new belongings in education, because to me that's a place where we belong, where we can belong, and where I think any child in care can find some work to find belong. But also that it's not just what I think is an measure success, there are other measurements of success, but for me this is education is what I will be focusing on. And so my research is exploring Kelly's experiences of transition. And today I'll be focusing on my story at the beginning and how I belong in education and my journey to university. Then I'll focus on the study one and study two that make up my PhD research. These titles probably do seem like gobbledygook because a lot of people won't know some of these words, but they're just the psychological terms to analysis. But I won't be talking about them today, you'll be pleased to know. So a bit about my background then. I've been in the social services from the age of three, and this was due to my mother being diagnosed with schizophrenia. She, I became a young carer for her from the age of 10, and my father wasn't able to look after us either during this time because he struggled with an alcohol addiction. I didn't enter care, though, to the last year of high school because most of the time during my childhood, I looked after my mum, and that was mainly what I spent doing. But seeing as my research is on transition, and it's on transition through education, I'd like to focus on my story through each educational establishment that I've been in since I entered care. So I'm going to start with high school. I went to this high school in Manchester, St Monica's, and during this time is when I entered care. And for me, this was a big, it was an upgrade. It was at the time that I was going to be sitting my GCSEs, and I felt that I no longer belonged anywhere. My relationship with my birth family had broken down, and my relationship with my foster carers, about two months in after the honeymoon period, broke down as well. And I, spent, I did spend the rest of my high school year with this particular foster placement. And I do have a great relationship with them then, but we just couldn't live together and it just didn't work at the time. And I was suffering with depression and addiction and during that year I, just, I became heavily addicted to alcohol and started getting involved in drugs. I was just in the wrong crowd and didn't feel that there was any hope. I had no self-belief in myself and just didn't, I didn't see that I would get my GCSEs. But... I had some great support workers at the time, as we all know them as the WAG officers. Um, she used to kind of follow me around a little bit and try and ensure that I would do my GCSEs and, and not so much attend school, because I did leave school in the April, but she tried to ensure that I kept going, that even though I'd left in the April, that I would keep trying to learn for, in preparation for my GCSEs. But this time of leaving high school was quite a big thing for me. I didn't really want to leave. I slightly felt like it was, it was pushed towards it. I went into care. I, I was suffering from depression. And they'd asked me, my, my um, head of year sat down with me and felt that, that wasn't, it wasn't the right place for me to be. Even though education was where I felt that I belonged. I felt at the time that I should go and seek some help and um, went to a professional, well, went to a doctor and he said that, he felt that I should also leave, so I did leave. Um, but I did. I stipulated two things, that I could do what every young girl, I think, well, most young girls want to do. I wanted to go to prom. I was adamant that I was going to prom, and they did let me do that, um, and that I could sit my GCSEs. Even though I didn't have much self-belief, I wanted to do that, because I knew that even if I didn't see myself being somewhere in a year, if I was, I needed them, and I knew that at that age. So I did sit my GCSEs and I did well enough to get into college. I attended Berry College and this was a time where the placement completely broke down and I no longer was able to stay. So at the age of 16, um, I left care and entered supported lodgings. And again, not long into the first placement, that one broke down as well. I think it was mainly, I would say a lot was down to my behaviour and the way things just didn't work. And the addiction was, was taking over. I just felt like I couldn't do anything but think about drink, think about those things in my life. And that's what became the focus for me. And then I started to fail my A-levels. And that's when I think I got the wake-up call. I started getting U's. I wasn't just getting D's and E's. I was failing papers outright. 
and it was like January time of my A-level year, people weren't, didn't have any belief in me by this point. They thought, well, she, they've written me off. They thought I'd end up in prison, that I'd end up with a, an addiction, and it wasn't the way that I wanted my life to really be, and I started to realise that. I was surrounded by people that had, that had been in care, that were taking drugs, that were on heroin, that were doing things with their lives that I didn't want to do. That's not where I wanted to be. And I think that was my, my biggest wake-up call. I can't really pinpoint exactly what helped me turn around, but a lot of it was to do with the people around me, the support that I had outside of that, fam that friend and family environment, and the support that I got from the professionals that were around me, the, my leaving care worker, um, my social worker, the, the school, the, the support officers, just people that just kept believing in me and didn't give up on me at all which led to me entering higher education. I got three Bs at A-level, even though no one believed that I could. I ended up turning around all my papers, <laughs> resitting, fought to get the money to be able to resit my papers because they didn't think that, they thought, well, you failed once, you're going to fail again. They didn't think that I'd do that, that I'd be able to do it. And I, I fought for it. I said, look, if I don't pass them, I'll pay for them. And that was kind of my way of trying to, because I didn't have the money at all, and it gave me a good incentive as well, because they were £15 each, and I had to reset five. Back then, that was a quite a bit of money. Um, <laughs> so I, it, did, it did kind of push me and drive me to keep, to keep going with that. Um, and when I got them, I, I was, I was uh, you know, over the moon. I was happy to be able to go to this university. But the first thing that I did face when I was applying for higher education was the application process. It's a little bit mind-boggling. It's not very easy. We don't all... Not everybody knows exactly which box we're supposed to tick. Some care leavers try to do it on their own, not knowing that you need to say you're estranged from your parents. And that's quite a big thing to... A statement to put as well, that we have to put to be able to get the right kind of support, which it says it's saying a lot, and not a lot of people want to do that. And so they, they tend to go through it, and I, as I've known from some of the young people I spoke to, They've, they've done it on their own and they've not got the financial support that they're, that they're entitled to, unfortunately. Another thing was the personal statement. That was a huge challenge. I didn't think that there was anything good about myself, especially at that age when all I did was drink. I didn't see myself as somebody who people could, could kind of invest in or see going to university and achieving. And I did have support with that. I, did, I, wrote, I rewrote it four times and I kept sending it into the... I think it was my um, principal at college, or something along those lines. And I kept sending it to him anyway, um, and he helped me. He, he, he helped me just turn it around and make it readable to an extent and show that I did have some good qualities, even though I didn't feel at the time that I did. And so I got a lot of encouragement and motivation. And one of the big things that happened for me that really helped is I got a personalised support package that I think every care leaver should get when they're going to go to university. Somebody actually sat down with me, even though I was the first from my own local authority to go to university, they sat down with me and said, look, this is what we're going to do. We don't, you know, we are winging it a little bit here. We've never done this before. But we're going to give you this support, we're going to give you this financial support, this pastoral support. You, know, you, you can come to us if you want to go back to your supported lodgings placement, you can do that too, we'll keep it open for you. And they did everything they could to ensure that I could had the best start for university. I can't say enough about my local authority. Yes, we've had our challenges and I've stormed out with cats, but at the same time, they, they were there for me. They looked, they looked out for me and they made sure that I got to where I am. I, obviously, a lot of that has to come from me as well, and it did. A lot of that had to be me realising that I could do this, and that, that is something that <coughs> definitely did happen at some point. And I got involved in supporting the education of children in care, which, is worked, which has really led me to what I do now. Because as soon as I started working with children in care and care leavers, I realised that I just, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to aspire other care leavers to go to higher education. I wanted to be an advocate for them. I wanted to show that they could do this, that they were a great group of people with a lot of potential that a lot of us overlook. And that's what I wanted to do. And then, luckily enough, <laughs> I, came, I got the LEMSSA scholarship for one student wanted to study a PhD at the University of Huddersfield, as Lemmers kindly lent his name to. Um, and 
again, something that I, a lot of people actually do ask me is how did you get this? A lot of people don't know about it and it's a very new thing and it's now we have the second Lens Say scholarship holder now as well that's just started this year. Um, and I was, I was just, I think at that time, it was about the February time and Lem had been in to do a public lecture and I, just, I remember meeting him and it was like rumours and that's all I knew about it was rumours. Um, and I remember speaking to him and speaking to the Vice Chancellor and a few other people and they were like, they, they felt I could do it but there was a few other people as well that could do it too and they just told me I needed to get a first and that's all I knew, I needed to get a first to be able to compete for this and that's what I did. I made sure that I got a first so that I could compete for this and then I got the Lens Essay Scholarship. So I'd like to just end a bit about myself with some of the people that have helped me. And I know you won't know who any, most of these people are. You might recognise one or two of them. But these are some of the agencies, Very Young Carers and Action for Children, that were there for me. And my foster parents, my leaving care worker, the college, um, and just great support from the university as well. People that were just, at the, that moment when I really needed it, turned around and said, you can do it. And they just, they were there at that point when I needed them to be. And I think that's what, if I could give any message for you to take away, is just to be there when somebody needs it and not to shy away from when somebody's feeling low and their self-belief isn't there. You know, cause sometimes I know it might be difficult if somebody's always down on themselves, but it does go through, it does get in. It, it got through to me eventually. It didn't, at the time, it didn't show any sign that it was going in, but it did. And I think that that's something that yet to take from it, really. So, in a much more academic setting that I'm now going to go into, um, my aim is to improve the experience of education for children in care and care leavers. And this is through my PhD research. This is the first step that I think I'm, well, I am taking to do this. This is on care leavers' transition to higher education. So, as we know, the statistics are relatively bleak for children in care. With only 15% achieving 5A star to C grade at GCSE, compared to 59% of general population. That's almost a quarter of those. And then it mirrors how they go on to access higher education as well, with only 7% going on. But again, the statistic is surrounded with a lot of mystery. We're not sure where it really comes from. It's based upon people that have been in care for 12 months and that year that went into care. So it could be a lot less, which unfortunately it probably is. I'm not going to say it's more. It's probably more about 2% because that's the statistic that keeps coming up, around 2 to 4%. There's been a lot of research recently. Well, not a lot. It's still quite underrepresented, but it has increased over the last decade with care leavers in further and higher education, which has shown that pastoral support is a huge thing, financial support, <coughs> accommodation, and consistency, stability and consistency come up a lot. But no one has ever looked into the transitions of children, the transitions in education for children in care. And I feel with looking at the previous research that's done with mature students, that the individual background could be having an impact on this on those transitions. Because people care leavers are getting in, but not always staying. And there's got and I feel there's got to be something said about that time and maybe something we can do to help them as well during that time. So, so far then, what do we know about transition for care leavers? This is mainly based on research to do with independent living and the transition to independence. They know they've got the increased chance of experience and other transitions during this time. There are many more than this, but we've got moving placement and changing schools. This happens a lot more for child in care. Much more likely to be living independently earlier than their peers. With a lot going to live independently around the ages of 16 to 18, even though I know you can now stay in care till 18, but this this still kind of, this still happens, and it's been seen to have an impact on education. What's come up a lot, I know that there's great practice. Don't get me wrong, I do know there's great practice, but what comes up in nearly every study is that they lack support during transition. And this is something that needs to be worked on. That is quite an out-of-date reference. So I do have more up-to-date references for this. <coughs> but they do, unfortunately, lack support. And this brought me on to my first study. My, my PhD is split into two studies, which I'll talk about today. I don't have enough time to go into my findings in depth, but if anyone wants to talk to me about them, 
I will, I will discuss them with you further. So the first aim was to explore care leave a transition to higher education and then whether life transitions during this time affected them. I used semi-structured interviews and asked them a series of questions relating to the transition to university. The biggest barrier I faced was recruitment because I found that even though I was a care leaver, trying to get gatekeepers to let me have access to other care leaver students was difficult. And I'd approached many universities for the first study and only two were agreeing to help me. In the second study, it changed a lot more. People started to know who I was. I networked a bit more and it did change. But then, people didn't really seem to want to help in a way. They did, I'm not saying they didn't, and I'm sure there's, you know, there's many other, there's many care leavers out there that, that haven't gone to university. There's not a lot, there's not a high number of care leavers that have gone, but there was some at these universities. So, in total, nine participants took part. Six were female, three were male, and they were all aged between 18 and 33. So there was a good mixture of people who'd gone the traditional route and mature students too. They were from universities in Greater Manchester and Yorkshire, and they were on a wide range of subjects. Five were in the first year and four in the second year. And this one took a retrospective look at the transition. It asked them to look back on, how that, on that time and their application process. And there was three main themes that I got from this study that's now published. And this was care leave identity, importance of positive university role models, and corporate versus normal parenting. Care leave identity really focuses on the impact that being in care has had on somebody personally and through the education system too. Importance of positive university role models, I found that a lot of people had somebody that they looked up to that had been to university. And I know that a lot of the professionals as well that we come into contact have that. So that could be something that we could instill in care leavers too. And corporate versus normal parenting. I put Normal is about what we think is our idea of what parenting is. I'm aware that what some of the examples I will give for parenting are not what we all see parenting actually is. But this is what care leavers feel they're up against. This is what they feel they're not getting. And that's what I think we need to be aware of that they do have different expectations maybe to what actually happens, but this is what they want and this is what, unfortunately, corporate parenting sometimes is falling short of. So I'm just going to show a couple of quotes for each to illustrate each one. For the care leaver identity, I often found that people wanted to reject this identity. Rhiannon says, I'm so embarrassed is that bad, I'm so embarrassed of saying I'm in foster care. And Catherine talks about how this affected her in education. She says, I never wanted to be seen as a foster child. So what I saw is that foster children weren't usually going to university. So I was going to go. And you find that in a way, care leavers, this, is, this particular care leaver has disassociated herself by attending university. She doesn't want to be associated with being a care leaver. So this is, in a way, her extreme way of getting out of that. And for positive university role models, what I found was only one participant had a positive university role model that had been to care. And this is the quote that I'm going to focus on today. Robert, um, Gavin said, Robert explained to me that there were other care leavers here, and my experience was that all care leavers are either pregnant or in prison, and there is no other option for you. And because coming here and meeting John, and oh my God, it's a guy that isn't in prison, that isn't uni, that filled me with confidence. And I was like, if he can do it, I can do it. It's not impossible. You can see the impact of just meeting another care leaver that's been to university had on this, per this young person. And in my next study, there were further examples of this too. And even just, not just somebody who's been in care, but any positive university role model has had it, can have an impact. Some of the other young people, it was their, their grandfather who, who absolutely loved university and had done a few degrees, or the stepbrother that had gone to be a, be a dentist and he looked up to him and these I think these are the things that if we can have those those type of people around care leavers it would help and this brings me on to the final theme I'm going to discuss today which is corporate versus normal parenting and this quote kind of is, is quite a powerful one from Leila she says you become a number a case file and that makes me angry because we're not we're people and like social services are meant to be corporate parents. And I've looked at the way I've been treated and people that I know have been treated. And I think if you're actually parents, we should be taken into care by now. And it kind of sends a message really that 
some people are getting that kind of an experience of care that they feel, well, why would they, why go into care when it's supposed to be better? And I've got a couple more examples here that are much more practical and based on how they think they should be parented. As Gavin says, a normal person, their mum and dad would be like, oh, your first interview, let's drive you down. Oh, aren't we excited, sort of thing. Sort of making it more fun than it is an intimidating sort of experience. And Rhiannon says, they would sit you down and make you do it in front of your face. Because I've seen my boyfriend and his mum, and he'd be like, I'll do it later. And she'd be like, no, you'll do it now. Sit there and make him fill out the application form. And we see that she's, with Rhiannon in particular, she's seen how her partner gets parented and how different that is to the parenting she's receiving. Yes, with Gavin, it's just an idea. It's, you know, he, how he thinks parenting is. But Rhiannon has a concrete example of how she feels, that, you know, she's not getting that right kind of parenting. And this was a huge theme across my first study, that people just felt a little bit let down by corporate parents. Although there were, there was usually one an outstanding person that went the extra mile. <laughs> And that was normally somebody within that field too. But as we know, there's a lot of corporate parents for one person normally. So how did I get from study one to study two then? Well, it's still a fairly underrepresented area of academic literature. So I felt that this needed more, explora more exploration. And I investigated transition at one point and felt that it would be a lot better to explore transition as it happened. So that's what study two does. And I felt it would potentially give me more access to this transitional stage and tell me more about that stage for these young people. So I aimed to explore care leavers transition to university longitudinally. And I did this through three stages during over a nine month period. Stage one was before enrolment at university. Stage two was in the participants first term. And stage three was in the participants second term. And they all took part in semi-structured interviews. There was only one participant that didn't do the final interview. Everybody else did all the interviews. And that was just because she, she couldn't fit it into a, a... She was too busy at the time. She just couldn't fit it in. And out of that, seven care leavers took part, with ages ranging from 18 to 21. Four were female and three were male. And a doll that spent at least two years in care. That's not something that I, that I was trying to get. It's just something that happened as part of this study. They'd all been in foster care including three with at least one placement in residential care, so quite a mixture of young people, and enrolled in a variety of courses, including business management, criminology and illustrating. And this came about four key themes and two integrated themes. Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to have a lot, any time to show you quotes for these ones, so I'm going to talk about a case study in a minute before I end. But the four key themes are exercising agency <coughs> and regaining control. This really looks at how young care leavers and children in care feel that the decisions have been made for them and that control has been taken away from them and how they look to fight back and how they try and get back some kind of agency for themselves. Most of them do this, I've talked about how they do this through education, but for others they do have other examples, you know, success through employment, doing something that's theirs, being some, like even being in the, their own home and choosing that. Going, to the, going down to, well, on, I can't remember what you call it, but when you go online and you, you apply for your housing, for council housing, being able to do that themselves was quite a big thing too. Um, exposure to university, pre-entry to higher education, which kind of follows along this positive university role model scheme I was telling you before, but not just that. Any exposure to university seems to have a huge impact on young people when they're thinking about going to university. Not just, obviously, children in care, but young people in general. And it did for this study. Every single person had some positive exposure to university. Modes of transition to university life looks at how they prepare, embrace, and disengage, and fit in, and how that, how that kind of works them for, for university. And perceptions of support looks at what they think supports them, what they believe is important to them, not what, what we may think is important for support. And there's two integrated themes that cut across all of this. Again, identity, and it is mainly curly of identity, and how it affects them having that kind of agency, access to control, how they had that access to um, university and if they got that opportunity to. And stability versus instability, 
which I'm, I'm sure we all know that consistency is a huge key. It's a huge key to success for many care leavers, and that when they have this stability, it, it does seem to lead to quite a successful story. But I'm only going to have a chance again to talk about three case studies, and I've looked at three people who've got a very a wide range of diverse experiences, and I can only talk about one of them today, which is Bethany. And unfortunately, <coughs> I'm only going to be able to focus on one element of hers because my story has is my, my sorry my research is vast. There's a lot of data, and I I can't unfortunately cram it all into just one sort of half an hour, which I'm sure I've gone over by now. <laughs> <laughs> Have I not gone over yet? <laughs> so, Bethany then. A little bit about Bethany. She was 21 years old at the time of the first interview. She was my only mature student. It's a bit weird to call her a mature student at 21, but that's what she was classed as. Age of entry into care was 14. She had eight placements in total. She spent four years in foster care and three years in leaving care placement. And she took the non-traditional route to university. And the main thing, themes that came from her study were supportive influences, feeling encouraged and cared for. And I, because this was kind of, my case studies were an extra thing, I decided that I would take one sub-theme from each theme and follow it along the three interviews for my analysis. So for, for this one, the main supportive influence is family. The second one is on supportive failing and failed relationships. And I'm not trying to shame leaving care teams there, but this was the main one for her. For other people, this wasn't the case. This was their main supportive and encouraging influence. But for Bethany, this, was her, this wasn't, and she felt that she felt quite let down and failed by then. And theme three is unsettlement, change of disarray. That's the one I'm going to talk about a little bit more in depth today. And the main thing that unsettled her was moving. She, actually, this quote sums us up for her. My whole life changed that Monday morning because I moved house and started university, the two biggest things you can do in your life. For Bethany, she moved into, she moved into a council flat in the first couple of weeks of starting university, and this had a huge impact on her. In the first interview, she talks about how she was moving from a supported accommodation, but there wasn't enough time for... There wasn't... Um, any, enough money available for her to stay where she was so she had to go and live with family for a couple of weeks which she didn't want to do whilst the council flat was being prepared she says I started university and was not eligible for housing benefit I couldn't afford to stay where I was and my flat wasn't ready I'm at my dad's well my nan's I didn't want to I wanted to go straight from supported accommodation where I was living straight to my new flat and my leaving care team said they wouldn't pay my rent for the week at supported accommodation because it was something like £250 a week. And I'm not suggesting that this should be what happens, but it's about not having that big transition at that early stage. And that's what seemed to have a huge impact on Bethany. In interview two, she talks about the more practicalities. She talked not just about the kind of um, having to take time off from a university at the beginning, but also about having to struggled to try and get deliveries to her house as well because she had nothing and she had to organise all that during the first couple of weeks too. She says, I moved out of supported accommodation over there on the Monday, went to, un went on the Sunday, sorry, went to university on the Monday and while I was at my nan's, it was all right, but once, because what happened, I had to take an afternoon off during the Learn to Learn week because I needed to go and pick up my keys for here because they could only do it on the Friday afternoon. I'd be waiting for about another week or so and I wanted to get in, so I took the Friday off. So we see that instantly that causes disruption to, her, to the start of her higher education journey. And in the final interview, unfortunately, there are loads of success. Not, I'm not saying that it's not that she wasn't unsuccessful, but she did drop out of university. There are every other young person did continue on, <coughs> but she does attribute this time of moving to that. She says this was the first time I was living on my own. So I sat in a lecture theatre thinking, have I turned my cooker off? Have I locked the door? Are the windows closed? Is somebody going to burgle me? What do I do with the Sophia? What do I do with an electric? You know, all these mad things going round in my head. I actually wrote a list of everything I worried about in my flat, about two pages, and that started panicking me because I was so far away from home. So we get an insight into how she actually feels going to higher education and, and moving into her own accommodation too. 
When I asked her what did she think had an impact on her leaving university, she said, I think if I hadn't moved out, because when you start worrying about house stuff and you're at uni, it's different. I think I don't really cope well to change. And she did say that it was just too much at once. This wasn't the only thing that led to that. She unfortunately was the, per the young person I was talking about before with fin student finances. She applied, but didn't, she, she didn't get support during that time. And she didn't have any student support financially for, I think it was for the three months. She ended up losing, le leaving at Christmas because she had no money, as well as these things too. And she found that when she'd gone to her leaving care team, they kept saying that they needed to know what the figures were, what the figures were going to be to be able to support her, to give her any extra financial support, and did not give her any support, which for other people this didn't happen. She had a, a sister at the time that this hadn't happened for, and they'd supported her, that she had a similar experience too. And unfortunately, in Bethany's case, she felt it, in a lot of ways she felt it was because of her age, because she was 21, and a lot they're expected to sometimes leave the leaving care system at 21. And she felt this kind of attributed to that. So what conclusions have I drawn upon so far? Well, the implications for professionals, I believe that one of the biggest things that I think should be happening is peer mentoring. That just another care leaver that's at university, I know that not every child in care wants to speak to somebody that's been to to university, but somebody who's been in their position, somebody who knows what it's like to be in care and to go for education, I think that that could really help. And I've seen it work. I've done it myself. I've seen it work. I just wish that it was national. I wish it was something that happened everywhere, even within local authorities. Just saying, would you be able to talk to this person? Would you be able to help them, help them with their options? You know, just show them the ropes a little bit. Empowerment in decision making, helping them to know that well, helping them make decisions, but that, so they know that this is their decision, that they're making this decision, because exercising agency and regaining control, that theme, did show that they didn't feel they had control in their own lives, and this didn't always lead to going through education as a way of fighting back. Sometimes they fought back in other ways that were a little bit more destructive. A knowledge of the application process. Again, we find that a lot of times people, do, there is, in a lot of local authorities, a designated worker that works with leaving, that works with those that are going on to university, but not in every local authority. And the, the young people were finding that people, they didn't really know what, what, to, what to do, what, you know, how they were meant to apply for this, what boxes they were meant to tick, what they were meant to do, and this had an impact on them during that time. Personalised, consistent and stable support, which I'm sure everyone as it had drummed into them, and I think this is a huge thing. It still, unfortunately, doesn't happen. It happens to an, a large, you know, I think some places it does, some places it doesn't, but it's coming up over and over that they're not getting, the, from one year to the next, especially my first today, they weren't getting the same support. It would change all of a sudden. Then they felt, well, I'm at university, I haven't got the same support, I can't cope now. And that was having a huge effect on some of those young people. And clear support guidelines for university. I think just knowing what they're avail what's available to them has a, has a huge impact on whether they do end up going. And I think there's a, a need for further research in this area, not just with university, but also with kids and their options, also going on to college. It's something that I'm going to be looking into and something that I wish that other people look into too. And I'd just like to end with, one of the, with a quote from one of the young people that's still at university now. And she said, it was the best decision I ever made. You can spread your wings. You can choose what course you do. You can choose what path you go down in life. And it was incredibly helpful. For, it was incredibly helpful for her and something that she is so happy now that she's done. A huge achievement that she feels that she has in her life. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
Uh, that was incredible. Thank you. That was incredible. I think that um, that 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 talk should go all over the country. I think you should go. I think you should be talking to all because it's right up to the minute, to the second. And I can tell that there were workers in this audience who were nodding in recognition of the scenarios that you that you gave examples of that are working with those young people right now. In other words, there are billions of talks that they've been to, that they go to, where they hear, um, not as up to the minute, feedback on their own situations as you've just given. You know, um, uh, that's not to denigrate the information that they do get. That is to say, not as specific um, to that. Um, so, I mean, or, or maybe I should just talk about myself and not just say that that's about you, you know. Maybe I shouldn't be saying that, oh, you, you're, you're, all your other talks are terrible, but that one was good. Uh, you know what I mean? I just realised I've just walked myself into a wall. I've walked into a wall. Because I like to take pot shots at social workers, you know what I mean, and the social services and children in general. Because it's a big, massive target, you know what I mean, Belinda? And I think to myself, well, I don't have to do that much, do I? Just close my eyes and take a shot and boom, I hit one, you know what I mean? And and, and then get a round of applause, you know, because the, the, because people people have a people have a people have a, an innate suspicion of social workers and the people who work with young people, uh, in particular, and um, it's because they're from my experience anyway. And I only talk about I'm not from an organisation. I don't have an agenda as such, uh, uh, but um, but uh, but it's because they're their kids. See, it's because the social worker is doing the job that may affect them. It's because they can't admit that there's a need, a total need for social workers. A total need, because the entire society is in denial. And you know who proves them wrong? The little shits. <laughs> kids. No, not the social worker, the kids. The actual child who's away from family is proof that family suffers from dysfunction. And anybody who's part of a family knows that dysfunction is part of its function. And yet it doesn't admit to it outside of its walls. But a child who's without a family in care proves the fact. And that, to me, is why nobody wants a children's home near them. That, to me, is why a child in care is a problem to be solved, not a solution waiting to happen. Do you know, I'm not... I, I, yesterday, I was being interviewed by Cambridge University Press for, the, uh, for a book and a video, which is going to be in nearly every school in Britain regarding the national curriculum and regarding English in particular, writing in particular. Um, and and the, the guys who were interviewing me were ex-exam board uh, guys who curated this, this book and this, this DVD. And I was asked, as part of it, because there was a whole lot of very specific questions, um, I was asked about rhetoric and speeches. One of the questions was, oh, you give a lot of, you know, you give a lot of speeches, Len, you give a lot of speeches. You know, <laughs> we need to talk about rhetoric, rhetoric, Len. And I don't know what rhetoric is. <laughs> and I said to them that I use, I only stood, I only understood that I use rhetorical questions uh, retrospectively, because people told me that I did. I've never constructed a speech with the three top numbers. Oh, etc. <laughs> I am what I am right now in the present as much as I can be. And the reason I said that, and I said that for a very specific reason connected to what I was just talking to you about. What was I just talking about before I started talking about rhetoric? <laughs> Come on. Excuse me. Thank you. And dysfunction. 
So, I just want you to know, it's not building up to a great three-point... <laughs> do you know what I mean? I believe in rhetoric, by the way, and I believe in the idea of it, and I understand how it can help you, but as I said in that yesterday, is that if you don't believe in the message that you're saying, don't use the devices to say it. That is to say that the, 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 the idea that you had, Sal, about, um, uh, about young people, uh, the, the, the overarching idea of the city, being a friendly and safe place for young people is a really, actually, a really powerful thing. And I think that, for me, to achieve those things that you were talking about in here, uh, this is just a personal thing, right, so you don't have to... Uh, I've not even introduced myself, have I? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I am so sorry. My name's Lem Sisse. I write books and I write poetry. And I write plays as well. And um, I am an honorary doctor of Huddersfield University for Humanities. And I'll tell you now, I've just been made honorary doctor of literature at Manchester University. I had to wait 25 flaming years to get my bloody education. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'm an MBE for services to literature, met the Queen, nice lady, small but nice. And, uh, not that there's anything wrong with being small, do you know what I mean? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I write poetry, and when I left care, the first thing that people said to me as I started to articulate what was going through me is, Lem, do you know what you should be? And I was like, what should I be? They were like, a role model. <laughs> <laughs> All they had to offer me when I had... Um, the, I had a lot of stuff to work through, but I was somewhat articulate in that I could communicate the confusion, which doesn't mean to say I could solve it. Uh, all they had to offer me was that I was a role model. Gosh. Uh, and then Belinda said to me just before I came in, you know, she said, yeah, but you are a role model. And she said, you are now because you've earned it. And I like that, Belinda. That's something that's special. I think I might have earned it. <laughs> As a care lever, you know what I mean? And I'm still a care lever. You know, you're not a care lever from 18 to 25. You're a care lever for life. You have a childhood for life. You're reminded, you'll be reminded soon at Christmas of all of the childhoods you've ever had. You'll be reminded of your mum because you'll call her. You'll be reminded of your mum because she's not there because she passed away two years ago. You'll be reminded of the family Christmases that you had when you were a kid, because you've now got kids, and they're saying the same things to you that you said to your parents, and you're reacting in the same way as your parents did. No, you're not. Yes, you are. No, you're not. Yes, you are. No, you're not. You're going to stop doing that, because they did that. You're going to do it that way. And you're going to do it that way as a reaction to the way they did it, but absolutely you are in relation to your childhood throughout your adult life, whether you like it or not. And the thing is, when you leave care at 18 years of age, after a, uh, after a life in care, you're consistently reminded in the same way as everything of everything that you never had on every occasion. Your birthday, your Christmases, your weekends, your, your, uh, your, the dysfunction of what happens in care is with you confirmed consistently for the rest of your life. I think that care leavers should be offered free therapy um, whenever they want it. Because it's not just when you leave care, it's 20, it's when you have a child, it's when you get married, it's when you're this, that and the other. Free therapy, free, when they ask for it. What I was going to get to then um, uh, is that, um, is that, that like, you know like families have histories? You know like they have history. You know like I was saying before about, um, about how, um, how society, I believe, sees the child in care as a threat. Oh, I've got proof of the child in care as threat. It happens in relation to our, our relation to the police, for example. I knew too much about the police when I was 14 and 15 in children's homes and foster care. If I ran away from homes, it was the police that came for me. I had too close a relationship to the police outside of me. And the staff around me, they had too close a relationship to the police as well. They mentioned the word police too many times in my presence. I was, it was called care. <laughs> it was called care. It was called care. And um, that's kind of Orwellian for me. Because if you can condition me to use the word care, you can then condition me to think that it's normal to use the phrase leaving care as care in itself. Now, as a kid, I'm not daft, you know what I mean? And, like, words have a thing with them. You'll know that when you talk to your own children, won't you? You know, that if you use a different word, they'll take it differently. 
So you're quite sure at times to say a particular word so that they receive it in the way that you want it to be received. Because they're firing on all cylinders. Because they're intelligent. Because they're learning what, what a word smells like. What it gives off. I spent my entire life in care with people saying to me, I'm in this job because I love children. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. 18 years of age, five different children's homes, fostered for 11 years. Nobody ever said to me in that time, I'm in this job because I love you. So I became to know myself as a non-person. You could say to me, well, I can't say I love you to a child. I've got to say I love children. I'll tell you what, don't say it. There's a thing. Do it. It's in that research there, love in practice, being there. All the examples, and by the way, I do speak from the privileged position of somebody who's not working with young people in terms of social work. But give me that privilege as somebody who has been in care and somebody who knows not that he is an, ex an expert, but knows that thousands of experts have not got it right. <laughs> so, so let me just, you know, be wrong. Yeah. But uh, that idea of... Uh, Leaving, uh, yeah, what I was going to say is that a lot of the examples for good practice with <coughs> kids in care, and I saw them here in the research, is it's really simple. It's uh, if the government, or if the, if, 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 if I'm going to say the government is, is, uh, is, is the parent, then uh, the child in care um, should be the best example as to how well that government is doing, above all services, above all services, above all services, these children who then become, how, does it, how is it that we become demonised? No, but how is that? How is that? I get people saying to me, well, you're not all good. No, we're not all good. And your child is not all good. Your child is all good. I think the examples are in our own family, you see. I think that if we applied some of the, the things that we apply in families to kids in care, we could really, really get somewhere. Sticking by them. Um, choosing our words carefully. Because I was in the train. No, I've got better examples than that. I was on the train coming up, and I thought, social work is not difficult because of the kids. It's got nothing to do with the young people. Social work is difficult because of itself. Because of itself. It, I think it's actually forgotten that the children are not it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the problems that you have in the offices and in the structures that you've built are not theirs. They're not it. They just came to you and said, help me. How did they then become the problem? Why shouldn't that girl say, screw you education after what she's been through in her flat. That makes common sense. But 20 kids in a building, 10 fire extinguishers. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that as soon as a fire extinguisher goes, there's trouble. You're thinking about insurance. You're thinking about this, that, the other, story getting out, this, that, everything but the fact that 10, 20 children, one children's home, five fire extinguishers, and signs everywhere that say, in case of emergency, break glass. I think a child, and why didn't this happen? That a child in care should be thanked every day for the fact they didn't smash the glass. But they're waiting for the glass to be smashed. My experience of the social services is of a group of people waiting for something to go wrong so that they could find a reason to be there. All, it all makes sense now. The kid's bad. This has happened. We've got to sort this out. We need a fire. Come on. We need a fire to put out. I speak from a privileged position, don't I? Because uh, there are problems out there. 
I think that the social services should be so good that um, that ki kids from middle class families and parents want their children to go into care um, and that it's a social worker's job to stop them from going in there. That's what I think. Uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't going to talk about all of this, but I, I, I now am doing. Um, I think a care should be a place where people want to put their kids in because it's that good. I think that when you come into care, you should get a free laptop. I think you should get, uh, uh, obviously, educated. I think you should have your own Facebook page. Uh, I think you should be able to put on pictures of yourself. I think you should be able to take pictures of yourself in the children's home, post them to whoever you want to, however you want to. Health and safety, I can see you all. <laughs> Not health and safety, but... But, uh, but that's what people do in, uh, in some families. I actually don't know, because I don't, I, you know, but... Uh, that's where I am, just so you know. Um, and I th think that... I just wanted to match something to with what, what you're saying, is that... That if we don't think of kids in care as being the most important thing of our society because the children of our society are the greatest resource but if we don't think of kids in care in particular as the greatest example of of our compassion our love our services um, then there will always be uh, there will this situation will be circular and it'll happen because Chuck, you're here aren't you we were together what, 25, 30 years ago for National Association of Young People in Care and Black and in Care, and we, we see policies right now at the moment re re reversed. Certainly thing. Um, I, 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 had, I had a lot... It happened with the poor houses. I was starting to say this a little earlier on. The uh, social services has got a history, just like a family has a history. And in the poor houses and the workhouses and the foundling museum that all were around in the 1800s <coughs> where children were taken in and lone mothers and the like, kids were uh, punished with one hand and served with another, told to work and... Uh, and I think that there's a total relationship to how we view children in care now. I think we are seen as bad. We are supposed to be embarrassed about being in care. The only way of reversing the idea of being embarrassed about being in care is to say that care is so good that everybody wants to be in there, period. It's to question every single person that ever puts down a social worker not with oh yeah it is bad and oh I can't I can't but with actually I'm protecting the most important people in this society so screw you in, in many ways you've got everybody against you the Daily Mail the, the Guardian even even like people on the street people that you know do you know what else I don't like uh, the carrying of the, the selling of stories we in care we uh, have stories and I see people sell, stop, feed on the stories of kids. Oh, John, <coughs> you, know, uh, you know that kid? You know what happened to him? Let me tell you what happened to him. I'm not talking about therapy here, and I'm not talking about uh, when, when social workers have to decompress and speak with each other professionally about it. I'm talking about in a staff room. Oh, you know what happened to her? Children's homes, this used to happen to a lot in. Oh, you know what happened to her? She this. And then that happened to her, and then this happened to her, and then she only goes and bloody does what? She doesn't, she does. And where does that lead? Exactly, exactly. There's only one thing I can see for her. There's only one thing I can see. You see, by doing that, by doing that, you are party to the problem. Not only are you part of the problem, you're actually making the problem happen. Period. Those stories, w w you've all got stories in your families and at home, and you don't talk to the, about them to other people like that. We are open for you to feed on us. We need your integrity to hold us in mind all of the time. The moment you spread our story like that, you kill a part of us. 
You genuinely do. Imagine somebody doing that to you in your family. Oh, well, you know what? I mean, they look well. They look well, but it's not like me. We're not there to be fed on. And we're not there to feed on ourselves either. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. Um, so for me, when I say that every child in care is a superhero, and I've said this before, and some of you may not have heard this, but Superman was a foster child. I'm just going to prove to you how, how far we are away from seeing young people in care as brilliant, as the same way we see our own children, flawed but brilliant. Superman was a foster child, Harry Potter was a foster child, Moses was adopted, Cinderella was fostered, Oliver Twist was fostered, Batman was orphaned. The list is absolutely endless. Think about the, your studies at your own universities. Think of David Copperfield. Think of the books by Jane Eyre. Think of, think of, uh, there's just, there's just bit, ba J James Bond. James Bond, Luke Skywalker. <laughs> Jesus was from a one-parent family. You know, we could split up into small groups and discuss that. <laughs> Mohammed, I'll say peace be upon, him, be upon him. I'm not Muslim, but I'll respect the, 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 the nature. Mohammed was fostered by his grandma. It's in the faith of Buddhism, right at the heart of Buddhism. I think Buddha himself had no parents, but I'm not sure about that. Um, uh, it's in the, the point is, it's not that all of these things are true, because they are in terms of them being fiction and non-fiction. Um, how do we not see it? How badly do we think about the child in care? How much are they invisible unless we're offering them a solution? How invisible are they until... Uh, sorry, what am I saying? How invisible are they that we have not seen that all of these characters in popular culture, in our religions, are related directly to their experience. Cinderella, Superman, Batman. There's loads of them, actually. I can't I'm keep going saying the same ones. There's billions. There's <coughs> something about us and our society that, that willfully will not accept the brilliance of the child in care and needs them to be a problem to be solved to prove our prejudice. And you know the best thing about it? Nobody's going to question it. Because everybody's on the outside of that thing. So children's homes don't happen. Kids in care are, you know, they're, you know, you know the children's home, you know what it's like. And, uh, you know, and, oh, did you? Were you? Did it? Oh, was it? Oh, God. How many dinners, dinners do I have to go to? Was it? Was it you? Oh, you were brought up in... I want the day to happen where people are like, oh, you lucky son. <laughs> you got the best education, you got the best flaming blah. I tried to get my kids in there, but they wouldn't allow it. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not kidding, you know, it's a genuine, you can see it, can't you? You can see how it could be like that. That's the aim. That's the aim, it's right up there. And it's possible. And this is to it. It was sponsored by the Huddersfield of University. Um, Huddersfield University gave all of the money for this, for this uh, incredible, um, what's it called, scholarship. <laughs> and um, incredible. And, uh, you know, I would say here, wouldn't it be great if Leeds University uh, itself set up a scholarship um, for a care leaver to do a PhD? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Yeah. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if all of the universities started to echo that same, same thing? Yeah. You know? Um, and I'm going to say that, by the way, I'm going to say that in Manchester as well, and I don't expect a direct answer. Yes, lad, of course, you, you say the word and we're doing it. But, but it, wouldn't it be an incredible thing if West Yorkshire led that uh, practice and, uh, and then started to knock on the door of Frontline, uh, who, uh, yeah. And uh, have you heard of Frontline? You'll have heard of Frontline, but, but, but uh, it's uh, an, an initiative. Anyway, um, of sorts, of a kind. 
I'm going to read you a poem. I write poetry, I write books and write plays and, th and that's it. And I didn't know I was going to say what I've just said, but I've said it. Uh, and it's kind of funny, isn't it? Because it's kind of counter to the narrative. The narrative is, has got to be something, it's got to be, I don't know, it's all a bit hunchbacked. Not yours, Belinda. <coughs> you know, but the act of kids in care are brilliant. And starting from there... It's a great thing, isn't it? If your kid, if your child, your own child is, is going through a problem and is acting up, you will want to deal with that from the same place that I've just mentioned, that that child is brilliant. And you're going to see them through it. Because you know that the teenage years, they go, they, go, they go nuts. They change into a different person. Yada, yada, yada. But you know they're the same and you stick by them. I think kids in care are amazing. Because they go through that experience and then get moved <laughs> for being a teenager. <laughs> Smoking a cigarette suddenly becomes a rejection of the foster family. <laughs> having, 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 a, having alcohol suddenly becomes a rejection of their family values. I was told when I was put into care at 12, much later on I was told, yeah, but we didn't know where you were from. We didn't know who, who, who your parents were. We didn't know. Yeah, it's a classic thing. It's, it's really simple. Child acts up. Foster parents ask questions of themselves and then think we don't know who his parents are. You become the enemy within. Enemy within, man. You become the enemy within. And then you, there comes a point where you start to ask yourself, what is it within me that is the enemy within got to be me. We're not stupid. We're intelligent. We're emotionally intelligent. We're reading everything all the time. Every single rejection. And we're told almost that that skill is, is, is not a skill. It's actually our fault. Incredible. I, think, I, I really do think that the child in care is the axis and that the bet, the, if we treat the child in care better, then our society will be a better place. I genuinely believe that. I, it, it's the right at the root of it all. You can tell I've not got rhetorical skills, can't you? You know what I mean? Because <laughs> the, 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 the meat and bones of it is quality. You know what I mean? I'm quality. <laughs> um, oh, I'll just read you a couple of poems and then I'll go. I don't know how long I've spoken for. Um, do you know how long? I've... Just slightly over length, but it's fine. Okay, all right. I'll just read two poems and then I'll go. Um, <laughs> You're not going. You're staying. For I'll, 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 yeah, I'll stay. I'll stay. I'll stay. I'm going to read. I'm going to read "Invisible Kisses." It's a love poem and it gets read once a week, once a month, somewhere in the world um, at a wedding. <laughs> it does. It does. It does. Uh, if there was ever one whom, when you were sleeping, who would wipe your tears when in dreams you were weeping, who would offer you time when others demand, whose love lay more infinite than grains of sand, if there was ever one to whom you could cry, who would gather each tear and blow it dry, who would offer help on the mountains of time, and who would stop to let each sunset soothe your shaded mind, if there was ever one to whom when you run, who will push back the clouds so that you're bathed in sun, who would open arms if you would fall, show you everything if you lost it all. If there was ever one whom when you achieve was there before the dream and even then believed, who would clear the air when it's full of loss, count love before cost. If there was ever one whom when you are cold will summon warm air for your heart to hold, who would make peace in pouring pain, make laughter fall in falling rain. If there was ever one who can offer you this and more, who in keyless rooms can see open doors, and in open doors see open fields, and in open fields see harvests yield. Then see only my face, 
in the reflection of these tides, through the clear water, beyond the riverside. All I can send is love, and all that this is, a poem and a necklace of invisible kisses. And I've got to say, I've never read that poem and related it to some of the things that I've just spoken about, ever. And I did then. Thanks very much. You're so lovely. slightly all over the place but I want to say that counterintuitive thinking is not a bad thing and it happens in families all of the time where a child does something and an adult says yeah but maybe it was that and the other one goes oh bloody hell yeah that doesn't happen to us in care it's got to be nailed straight away counterintuitive thinking is something that happens through creativity and this is why as an artist when I left care I, said, I don't want to be a role model but I do want to be a poet and, and I became what it is that I wanted to be. And I've been supported by social workers, uh, sorry, by uh, universities throughout my adult life. Yeah. Anyway, thanks, Sir Belinda. It was just beautiful. I'm very proud that they've, everybody here has heard the first ever uh, talk by the first uh, graduate for this particular scholarship, which is the first in the country. You did an incredible job. It made me very proud to see it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, again, follow up. <coughs> uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Margaret House. Uh, I'm Vice Chancellor of East Trinity University, um, Chair of Heart. I'm very proud to say a uh, Child friend of Leeds Badge, yeah. <laughs> Um, wow, what an evening, I can honestly say. I haven't had such a stimulating, thought-provoking, and indeed challenging two speakers um, as we have had this evening. And uh, there's more to come. But can I just say, Linda, let me echo uh, what, what Levin said. Um, gosh, as someone who didn't have much self-belief, uh, you know, that was a, an amazing presentation. The work you're doing is fantastic. I can't wait to read the thesis and... Uh, for you to kind of come and talk to, to my staff in terms of what, what we should be doing. And, and Len, uh, in response, um, I will pledge with the cameras on <laughs> that we will, Leeds Trinity University will sponsor um, a care leader. Have you ever seen Police Academy, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> Whilst we're waiting, Len, there are uh, two more universities in Leeds. Right. So we could do with another couple of places. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Linda, I've just got a bit of a question. It just seems very disappointing that universities don't have the same level of because your comments were specifically about yeah. local authority and not supporting. Also, no sense that the university supported her in a decision before she left. It was also, I mean, I only could focus on a couple of points at that, during that presentation. But, yeah, so a, 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 she, there were people at that particular higher education. She just found that she couldn't, every time she went to access it, it never seemed to work for her. She, she went to, she found out the name of the person, 
sent them an email, they didn't respond. Sent them another email, they didn't respond. Mm -hmm. And just, she tried, she exhausted every single option. And just near to the end, she did go to her university and say, I've not got any money. She, she told them again at the end, at the Christmas time. They said the next day, they were going to try and help her. But then when she, when she went home, she had no more money to go back. She, family had been helping her because she was one of the only ones with a strong family connection. And they'd been supporting them. There was just no more money. She just decided then that she needed to, she, she couldn't do it, unfortunately. I was disappointed from the university, from the university, that any student, no matter what, whatever the background, would just not want to leave because of no financial support. But it, it's particularly, can I just say, because mm. uh, I, I, I've not heard my voice for a bit just now, so. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, it's very particular, isn't it? It's a, it's a child in care's experience rather than any young person. It's very particular. I think you mentioned a great thing there. You said personalised. What was that? Personalised? Individual. Personalised support packages. Personalised support packages. And she obviously didn't have that. No. Is that right? That's right. She didn't have that kind of... Neither local authority or university sat down with her and offered, told her what she was entitled to. And it, unfortunately, from knowing of that particular local authority and knowing of that university, they have supported other people. And they have greatly, in, you know, been there for the people during financial hardship and emotional hardship, but not for this particular person. Can I just chip in there? We are, as, as you, I mentioned at the beginning, we are members of the National Network for the Education of Care Leavers, and I know there are quite a few members in, in the audience here as well. And the national network is very much about trying to get the levels of support more consistent. So, so the comments that Belinda has made through her presentation tonight, we're trying to find some sort of form of consistency across the whole country so that all universities, all FE colleges, are looking at how they can actually support children in care, lead care leavers, Perhaps that's not the right phrase. It's a term I use, by the way, because yeah. there's no, there's no there's other no that yeah, really yeah, worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that sort of process is there. And my personal belief is, and I think this goes along what Lem's been saying, if we can get it right for care leavers, that benefits every single student in the system. Because if it's right for care leavers, that benefits the person from the middle class, the upper classes as well, who have the privileges already. They benefit from that process. So I think we're, we're striving through the national network to try and make that happen. And it's, it can be an uphill battle. I'm looking across at Megan in particular. It can be a, an uphill battle at times, can't it, Megan? It can. We're, we're yeah. knocking on the doors. We're knocking on the doors. Yeah. Um, at the back, and then. Oh, so you had another question? I do. I was just going to say, in regards to education, one of my I'm a project officer for the City Council, and I go around promoting young people's um, voices. And I think one of my struggles growing up in care was actually what Belinda said, that actually, yeah, you took my mum, you took my dad, you took 13 of all my brothers and sisters, and the only thing that I had left was my education. And I sort of like got my back up and put the message out, like, you took everything else, you are not taking my education. And with that, I did go to, um, go on to do my GCSEs, go to college, and I started university. So, and now I'm in this job, so I feel Brilliant. very, very lucky to be where I am now. Um, and it's about promoting that message and getting it out. If I can do it, then anybody can mm. do it. And just because you come from a bad start in life doesn't mean you have to end your life at a bad point either. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> There was other independent agencies. I, I can't obviously give their names yes. and really go into it too much, but there were often, if, if they didn't have support from the local authority or from the university, there'd normally be another agency that was there that was helping them. And it's usually ones to, to do with um, maybe disabilities and things like that. And that would normally be the other agency. And young carers was quite a big one. Hi, I'm Ibrahim Maynard. Um, 
two things. I've come actually in place of someone called um, Phil Slack, who is a specific worker of an MP, <coughs> who is from our Bradford Local Authority, who works with care and with specifically at the university. I don't know if Leeds has that or Huddersfield or any of those, but it's something we need to really think about because we actually have two workers. We have one and a half or nearly two workers because we have about 33, about 13 care leaders at the university in different all over the country. And I think that's helped quite a lot, really. Just going back on to me, personally, um, I was in care, as Glenn, like, like I said, um, for many, many years. Um, and I was moved about quite a lot, about 12 different children's homes and foster homes and lots of doctors when I was young, which only found out later in life. Um, and, you know, I was moved out so much, I even missed, I actually came to Leeds, actually, and I missed school, I went to St. Mary's School, if that's still open. And I missed school for quite a while because I couldn't decide whether I was going to go back to Bradford or stay in Leeds. It was this thing of, what am I doing? But I missed so many months of school. Um, so when I actually left care, it was like, I haven't done anything really. And I became a gardener and that. But eventually I knew that I had my passion back in wanting to support young people, as I said, as Len said, I was involved in an organisation called Bradford in Care um, and National Association of People in Care. And I wanted to try and put something back into the system. So I actually thought, I want to go back into it. And I went through youth work. And one, one interesting thing, actually, my social worker said to me, we well, don't go away to the children's homes that are, have some space for us, have some time out. And I actually think that was a good mm. advice in a way, really, because it gave me that space to actually, well, become a garden, play with flowers and that. But um, it gave me that time out. And then I went to, into youth work and looked at that perspective, and then went into social work. Um, and I did the Diploma in Social Work when I was about 28, I think, quite, quite long. But actually, my thing was, why did I have to wait all that time to do that? Um, because my education was quite poor, and I did the old type CSEs sort of stuff. Um, but I, the, the thing to me was, I achieved it. I got the Diploma in Social Work, I did very well, and that was fine. Um, and I've done connections, uh, Diploma in Social Diploma in, Diploma in Connections as well. So I've got certain things. I'd like to do a scholarship, I suppose, eventually. Um, mm. And I've got a friend who I thought about here, Darren Coyne. Yeah, I thought Darren was going to be. Was a, it was interesting in criminology and all that. Because <coughs> that issue, cause that's a big issue as well for young people doing care in terms of criminology and issues around how are they made criminals. And rocket science.